today but where are you you're upright you're in God's house (laughs) I don't know any of us that are terminally ill in this room today but we could be and we're not (laughs) because we serve a good God who deserves our praise Lord we thank you for being a good God today we thank you that you love us beyond anything that we could ever imagine let's give him some praise come on lift up your voice We thank you, Lord. We praise you today. Praise the Lord. It's so good to see you all this morning. I'm glad that you're here. Mr. Brent, that usually uh, receives our offering, he and and, uh, Heather are on vacation, and we're glad that uh, folk get an opportunity to take a vacation. Matter of fact, we've got a bunch of people that are vacating this week, taking advantage before school starts, and we're glad they're able to do that. But this morning, if I could just make mention to you, the Lord encourages us to give. He said, give and you shall receive. Press down, shaken together, and running over. And then there's another scripture that says, as you give, it'll be given back to you. So that gives us the connotation of if you give a little bit, you get a little bit. If you give a lot, you get a lot. I'm not saying today that we need to buy our blessings. There's no way we could put a price on what the Lord has done. My wife and I feel like that we have been supernaturally blessed over the years that we've been working for the Lord and serving the Lord. He has supernaturally blessed us, and I would be ashamed not to give exceedingly abundantly above in my giving. I give to the best of my... 10% is not an not a item for us. We go above that. And I challenge you, each of you, if you want to check out the Lord and check out and see how your life can be blessed, go over and above what you've been doing and give and check the Lord out. He said, test me, try me, check me out, prove me and see if I'll not open up the windows for you. If you guys will, uh, stand up. I know you've just now been, been seated, but if you can, come, come on up as they play something and bring your gifts to the Lord. If you give online, don't forget to do that whenever you want to do it. And uh, the more you give, the more we can operate and do what the Lord's called us to do by reaching out and doing the work of the Lord. So as they play something, come on up. And as you go back to your seat, uh, or if you're still in your seat, reach over and shake somebody's hand, greet them, and tell them uh, that you're glad to see them in the Lord's house today. Okay?
Okay, just keep your seat there, if you will. And uh, if you're still talking, don't worry about it. It'll, uh, it'll be okay. Stretch your hand up this way, would you? And let's bless this offering. Father, as we look in these baskets, we see a portion of people's lives. Lord, I know that you honor when we sacrifice. So thank you for every sacrifice, every gift that's been given. And I pray, Lord, that you'll multiply it before ever it's counted. And Father, that you'll also let a portion of that gift go back to those that have given it and let each of their needs be met in a mighty way. I praise you for what you're doing in this church. I thank you for the blessings that you continue to pour out. And Lord, we love you so much. I thank you for this praise team and for the awesome job that they always do. I just thank you that your spirit is here, that you're rich in this place. And Lord, I know that there may be people here that are needing this morning, needing a touch from you, needing a hand to lift them up, needing an encouragement. And I pray that you'll be that for them this morning. We just thank you so much that you love your people. And we ask in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let me ask you, who, who all can come to our baptismal cookout service next Sunday up in Townsend. Let me see you. Matter of fact, just stand up, if you will. I want some commitment here. We're going to have a family day, and we sure would love for you to be involved. This is a family day. It's not a day to stay home with your family. It's a day to come out to God's family, and let's enjoy what the Lord is doing. Now, those of you that are standing up, obviously you're coming, so is there anyone that would like to be baptized next Sunday? Or maybe you have a child. There's a, one little girl wanting to be, somebody else has got somebody wanting to be baptized. Okay, so we're going to have a baptismal service next Sunday as well. And it's okay if you change your mind on the spot. Just pre, be prepared. I, I wanted to come prepared, so I'm going to bring my uh, baptism clothes and uh, we'll be ready to go, okay? And uh, please don't forget, it's at 3 p.m., and if you could bring a side dish, Randy's got a sign-up sheet back here in the foyer. Uh, if you'll put your name and what you're going to bring so we don't all bring a potato salad and nobody have anything to eat but potato salad. I'd have to go hungry. So uh, it's got mayonnaise in it, I believe, don't it? I, I couldn't hardly handle that. Everybody that eats mayonnaise is going to die. You believe that, don't you? Well, it ain't got anything to do with the mayonnaise. You're going to die anyhow. But I just thought it sounded good. Well, I'm so glad you're here. And you can sit back down for a moment now. David's coming up to talk to us about our marriage retreat coming up really soon. Hey, just a quick announcement. On September 22nd and 23rd, we're having the marriage retreat. We're going to have it here. We wanted to make it more accessible to everybody. And we want to invite uh, engaged couples as well. So it's going to be a Friday evening. And then a good portion of Saturday afternoon. So we're going to have, it's $75. We're going to have two catered meals. We're going to have child care provided. Um, and it's a lot cheaper than it was before. So I need you guys to sign up uh, because we have to have so many couples signed up or we can't get the food. Basically, it's not going to happen if we don't have enough people sign up. So if you're thinking about going, if you want to go, if you plan to go, the sign up sheet's in the back. Uh, it's going to be a good time. We're talking about the marriage you've always wanted. So <clears throat> a couple books I've been reading, one's called Sacred Marriage, and one's called The Marriage You've Always Wanted. No matter how long you've been married or how short you've been married, we can all be better at taking care of our spouse. And that's what we're, we're going to talk about is uh, being uh, Christ-like to our, to our spouse. So it's going to be a good time. Uh, it'll be a little bit of time away from kids, a little bit of time away from the hustle of normal life. So uh, sign up in the back, please. I need you all to sign up. So thanks.
Once again, I think we should give Danny a hand for her video. Yes. <laughs> Let's stand up, and we're going to go before the Lord and, and just ask the Lord to be here in this place today. Lord, we invite you to come and to be in this place, Lord. This is your house. And, Lord, we've gathered together here um, to worship you, to let you know that we love you, we want to serve you, we want to do the best we can to be who you've called us to be. Lord, we ask that you help us this morning as we go into worship to put our everyday stuff on the back burner. Lord, that you would be the forefront of our attention here today. And we thank you for the things that are going to be accomplished because you're here. In Jesus' name.
is so undeserved a love that we can never earn but you give it freely
there's nothing worth more that will ever come close no thing can compare your our living home your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free shame is under in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome come flood this place and fill the
that loves us like Jesus loves us. There's nobody else who gave himself for you. There's nobody else that stood at the whipping post for you. There's nobody that made his mind up that he loved you that much that he would stay on the cross. Lord, we thank you for that love that so undeserved. We praise you today. But it's because of your love, of your great love, that we're able to be here. That we're able to be forgiven and washed clean. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, as as we go into a time of your word here today, Lord, I ask that you cleanse our minds and our hearts. Lord, if we failed you in any way, Lord, we ask that you cleanse us. That your word would be planted in good ground here today. We ask that you would anoint pastor, that you use him in a mighty way. That, Lord, every word that you've given him, Lord, that you just give him direction. Holy Spirit, that you move in this place. That you go before him, Lord. And we thank you for the people that are going to be different. 
in the situations that are going to be different, the mindsets that are going to be different because of the word that you have for us today. Help us to listen. Help us to hear what it is that you want us to hear today. And we thank you for always showing up, for always coming, when we don't deserve it at all, but you do anyway. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Let's give him a praise while you're being seated this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, praise team. Thank you to each of you that are here this morning. I really appreciate you coming. See, some of our visitors that have been visiting with us recently have returned, and we're glad to see you guys with us this morning. Thanks to each of you for being here. This is a great day to worship the Lord. This is the first day of the rest of your life. Did you imagine that? the first day of the rest of your life. And I'm excited that you have chosen to spend a portion of your day here with us at Rio East. We're so very thankful for that, and we're glad that you're here. I want to say a great shout of appreciation and thank you to our VBS workers that made our VBS this year a, a huge success. And let me just put a little bug in your ear. Next Sunday morning, Next Sunday is the last Sunday of July. Can you imagine it's already here? The last Sunday is here. But next Sunday morning, we will be having the kids out here in the sanctuary. The kids are going to be doing the dance that they learned in the VBS. And we will be doing some drawings for some of the vac Vacation Bible School workers, some of the volunteers that work to help us make it effective. We've got a whole bunch of, uh, of drawings that we're going to do that morning. It won't take a long time, but we're going to be excited to reward and to appreciate some of our VBS workers, and thank you all. Miss Wanda, we really appreciate you, our children's pastor, for all that you do, and I know we don't say that enough. So while we're recognizing people, let me say thanks to all of our Facebook folks that are watching today. We appreciate you guys being there, and I pray that all is well with you. Those of you that are on the beach with your toes in the sand, I hope you have a great week this week. And whatever you may be finding yourself doing, I pray that it will bring honor and glory to God. And if you're vacating, that you get plenty of rest. I want to shout out a hello to Vinny and Kim Provitone. Uh, they're out in Hungry Horse, Montana. They're our campus pastors there at the campground that's owned by Christine and Phil Marshall. The name of the campground is Timberwolf Resort, and we're so thankful that Kim and Vinny are taking care of that. They call me or text me last night late. They're two hours behind, and so they text me after their service last night. They show the morning service, the Sunday morning service, the following Saturday night. That's the way it works out best with the campers coming in and going out. So they did that service last night and said it was another phenomenal service that God showed up and blessed and He ministered. And so we're very thankful for what they're doing. Really appreciative of Phil and Christine Marshall for allowing us to do that ministry there. So thanks to everybody for all that you're doing. Brother Ron Brewster, see this gentleman over here in this temporary chair that he's sitting in? That's temporary. He's going to be running around probably here after a while. But at any rate... I want to thank you, Brother Ron, for following the Lord. Brother Ron has opened up a ministry out at the nursing home where he's at. And he has, how many did you have the last week? About 20 people in attendance for his Bible study. So let's give Ron a hand this morning. Praise the Lord. Very excited that the Lord's using ministry outside the four walls that God is going and ministering. Our campus uh, out at uh, East, Rio East at Rockford, uh, has been doing jail ministry and been very successful in that. They've been doing outreach service down here at Food City. If you would ever want to be involved in any of that, just let us know and we'll put you in connection. It's going really well. The jail ministry, they're open down there of allowing new people to come in. They're actually doing classes on that. So if you're interested in that and want to be a part of that, we'd love for you to be a part of it. So I'm going to Hebrews this morning. If you want to be turning there in your Bible, we'll have it up on the board if you didn't bring your Bible with you. But if you have it on your iPhone or your iPad or your i whatever or oh whatever or whatever it might be, 
uh, that's electronic, we uh, welcome you to go there. Just try to put it on silent, if you will, so that it don't uh, uh, interrupt your neighbor when your uh, next door neighbor pages you or texts you. But uh, we're, we're welcoming you, and we're so glad that you're here. And let me just simply say, as we kick off this message this morning, it's going to be a bit different. It's going to be a bit different than probably what you're used to. Uh, this is something that God's been dealing with me about for several weeks. And it seems that the Lord is changing. He's changing the uh, measure of anointing in this place. I don't know how to explain that other than to simply say there's a heavy anointing upon us right now, and I'm not sure what God is fixing to do, and when I say us, I'm not just talking about me, but I'm talking about the platform of ministry for this church. I'm talking about the outreach ministry. I'm talking about God is preparing people, and God is going to send leaders into this place so that we can do the work in these last days that He's called us to do. Some of you are already here. You just haven't taken the helm yet. Some of you are here, the anointing. You haven't put on the cloak of anointing just yet to do the leadership that God's called you to do, but it's coming. So think about this with me for a moment as I get this message started this morning. There was a lady that went to a to a yard sale or a rummage sale or, or, or one of those outdoor events where they push stuff out on the sidewalk and out in the garage. And you know what I'm talking about. Some of you folks love those things. I prefer the estate sales, but if it's just a regular garage sale, I, I normally don't go. But anyway, a lady, and we're not going to mention any names this morning, went to this garage sale. And there in the garage sale, the first thing that caught her eye, she's one of these individuals who likes antiquities. Anybody like that? Some of you like antiquities because you're an antique yourself. That was supposed to be funny, so you can laugh after a while. But at any rate, she saw this old kettle, an old copper kettle. Now, does anybody know what happens to copper if it's not paid attention to? It tarnishes. It turns and it looks just plum ugly. Sometimes it gets a, an old green looking growth on it. And they call that, in some areas of antiquity, they call it uh, patine. Uh, but we're not going to call it that this morning. We're going to call it nast. Is, is, that okay? is that a word, nast or just nasty? Okay. So anyway, this old kettle was nasty. It was covered in old green slimy looking stuff and it didn't even look like copper. It looked like something that come out of the dark ages. And so the lady, it caught her eye, so she picked it up and she went up to the table and there was a, a, a tag on the thing, on the handle of it, and it said $2. So she said, okay. I'm interested in it. I like it. She took it up to the lady that owned the home and, and, and had the, the yard sale there. And she said, I, I have a question for you. Do you think that this can be cleaned up? And the lady looked at her and she said, probably so. So she took it from her. She went inside. She had some copper cleaner. Has any of y'all ever used that stuff? She put some copper cleaner on it and she got a cloth, a cotton cloth. And she started chamois that thing. If you don't know what chamois is, that's what we guys sometimes do to our shoes. We used to, anyway. The military still does, right? Still, they don't even, do, he don't know. It. They wear tennis shoes in the military now, so who knows? But anyway, she started chamois that thing, and she could see her face in that old pot. And she brought it back outside, and she showed it to the lady, and the lady took it, and she just, she just gasped. And just before she said, I'll take it, she noticed the price tag. And instead of being $2, it was now $10. So what are you saying, Pastor Dale? I'm saying that everything looks better, is more dependable, is more profitable, is more expensive when it's clean. I'm going to talk to you this morning about being clean. And also before I show you the title of the lesson or the message this morning, let me just explain to you. As times change, we're living in a, in a society, we're living in a world today that gets uh, upset over just about anything. And so in the country of Britain and in the country of Switzerland and in the country of Ireland, they used to have a saying, and some of you may have heard it. If you're as old as I am, I know that you've heard it. But people used to go around and saying, oh, that's just bloody. It's bloody good. 
You heard that? Anybody ever? It's bloody good. They caused them because of offenses that came. They had to quit using that little phrase. But I'm going to use it this morning. And I'm going to simply say, I'm going to give you the bloody good news. The bloody good news. I'm not associating that with anything that's British or anything from any other country but another land. There's bloody good news that's given to you this morning from another land, from another place, from another area, from another world. There's bloody good news that's coming today. And my goal this morning is to help you and I understand the plan of salvation is so simple that a baby can understand, that a child can be born again, and that you and I can have absolutely no excuse when we stand before God and we say, God, I didn't know how to be saved. God, I didn't understand it was too large for me. It was too big for me to overcome. That mountain of salvation, I just couldn't get there because I didn't know how to do it. My friend, the love of God. You heard this group saying about it, it's so deep. It's so pure. God just keeps on loving. Loving. His love never ends. He just keeps on keeping on. Let's read the Word. I've got a lot of Scripture this morning. How many of you know, if I never get anything said but the Word of God, it'll be enough? It'll be enough. So I'm going to preach from the Word of God, straight from the Word of God, as I always do. I'm not going to pull any punches, and I'm going to help you to see how simple the plan of salvation is. We're going all the way back in the Old Testament, and we're going to visit the blood, and what happens with the blood, and how necessary that the blood is. Some of you may have had questions, and you were just too embarrassed, or maybe you were too uh, feeling too uh, that, that somebody would think that you didn't know. You may not have ever understood why that God required a bloody sacrifice. But this morning I came to tell you it's bloody good news. Hallelujah. This Word of God, gospel means good news. Can I hear one amen? This gospel means good news. It doesn't mean that there's a, a, a bunch of, 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 of little animals that have given their lives and people have been forgiven. But no, it's bloody good news. It goes deeper than that. Let's look at Hebrews. Hebrews gives us the story. It's starting at verse uh, chapter 9, starting at verse number 11, and it goes through verse number 28. Yes, it's a lot of reading, and I'm not going to get in a hurry today. I am not going to get in a hurry today. If you've got lunch at home and it's in the oven on a timer, I hope you set it a little later, because it'll probably be 3 o'clock when I get done. You say, Brother Dale, you'll be preaching to empty pews. Mother Teresa has listened to me a lot of times, but I hope you don't leave. Verse 11, but Christ came, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, help us to get our minds open and our hearts to where we can receive. God, I pray for every man, woman, boy, and girl in this place, and I ask you to let the blood of Jesus Christ fill up this building, Lord, and help us to know that it's because of that blood that we can be clean. And it's because of that blood that the good news comes. God, I'm asking you once again, use your servant this side of eternity for your glory, for the power of love to reach forward, and the word of the gospel to reach in and deliver someone, God, from the clutches and from the stains of sin. In Jesus' name. But Christ came as a high priest of good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood, He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Verse 15. And for this reason, what reason? For the reason that He was the mediator. For this reason that He paid the price. For this reason He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the in eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, 
there must also of necessity be the death of a tester. Let me read that again right there, and let me put another word in there that might resonate with some of you all. For where there is a will, for where there is a will, has anybody got a will in this place? What's a will, Brother Dale? That's stating what you want to happen after you die. Did you know that that will is not any good until you die? Did you know that the Testament, the New Testament in the King James and in every other version that is speaking the original words, did you know that that is the will of God? And somebody had to die for that thing to be enacted. How do you know that, Pastor? Look on. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testor. Verse 17, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the tester lives. It's exactly what we were just talking about. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. Verse 19, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Notice notice this closely. Uh, According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The King James says there is no forgiveness. Look at verse 23. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What's that saying? It's simply saying that in the Old Testament law, The law was given. The instructions were clear. The the, the high priest was to sprinkle things with blood as was given orders. But then it's going on and saying that was just a sign. That was just an indicator. That was just a shadow of what was to come. Jesus Christ Himself took His own blood into the holy place, into the holy of holies. And He did what was the will of God as He sprinkled for the sins of humanity. Let me read 23 again. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What's better than the blood of bulls and goats? What's better than the blood of a life? Pure blood. Pure blood. We'll talk about that just in a minute. Verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. Now, to appear in the presence of God for us, not that He should offer Himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the ages, He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. Talking about Jesus. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Aren't you glad that there's an opportunity for you and I who look like without the blood of Jesus, that old cankered pot, those of you who have not been forgiven, those of us who don't go to God and ask for forgiveness, we start cankering, we start looking like that old pot, but aren't you glad that there's been a a sacrifice that's been paid that will clean you as clean as copper as a new penny, if I can use it that way. See, when the owner took the trouble to clean away the grime off of that kettle, it made it worth four times more than what it was original. Almost everything is more valuable once it's been washed and once it's been cleaned up, and so it is with you and I. The Bible tells us that we're all stained with sin. The guilt and the shame of our sin takes away our value. 
How do you know that, Brother Dale? Romans 3, verse number 23 puts it this way, for all. Look over at your neighbor and say all. A-double-L means you too. All means everyone. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that He has created a unique, that, that problem, all sinning has created a unique problem for each of us. Habakkuk puts it this way in chapter 1, verse 13. He says, you are talking about God. You are of purer eyes. Your eyes are too pure than to be able to look on evil. In other words, without the blood of Jesus, God cannot look on you and me. Without the blood of Jesus, God can't look on evil. Why do you think that God, God the Father, turned His back? And Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama tabatani. What was He saying? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it was very simple. He had to turn His back because at that moment, God allowed all the sins of all humanity to be placed upon the back of our Lord and Savior, and God couldn't look at it. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. But the Bible also tells us that God so loved the world that He offered us a way to wash away our sins, a way to cleanse our souls so that we might regain the value that He created us to have. Did you know that you were born, the first time you were born, you were born to be a child of God? But it took your obedience. It took your will. It took your asking for forgiveness to be born again. So let's talk about this. The, one, the first thing I want to talk about is the method of washing. The method of washing. Why don't we, Brother Dale, just go to the car wash and walk through the car wash when we get real good and dirty and let the brushes just scrub us real good. My friend, there's not a Tide dishwashing liquid or laundry detergent or anything that can wash you like the blood of the Lamb. I'm talking about a spiritual washing here. I'm talking about a necessity for you and I to be able to go to heaven. There's one way to get to heaven. No matter what you may hear, no matter what you may pick up on the TV, no matter what this person or that person says, this person says there's one way to get to God. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And yes, it is bloody good news. Some folks say we're not putting the blood anymore. I went to a church one time and they said, Brother Dale, don't preach on the blood. And I said, I'm leaving. I can't stay here and not preach on the blood. The first night I preached in the revival. I preached on the power in the blood of the Lamb and prostitutes were coming in off the street. And during the altar time, the preacher left. What are you saying, Brother Dale? I'm saying we are a society now that we get offended. We get our feelings hurt. And when we say it's a bloody good time, and people get offended, we say, oh, I won't say bloody good time anymore. But I'm telling you, it's bloody good news this morning. Without the blood, you perish. Without the blood, there's no hope. Without the blood, there's no future. Without the blood, we all are doomed and damned. It takes the blood. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ. You must be born again. And there's no way to get born again except for coming through the blood. You say, Brother Dale, I have a prayer that I can pray. It's a repetitive prayer. And I say, Oh, God, Muhammad, have mercy and treat me fairly. If Muhammad could preach to you today, he'd tell you there's no entry into heaven through Muhammad. So the method of washing, looking at 9.22 again of Hebrews, pulling out a portion of that Scripture that simply says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. 
There is no remission. There is no cleansing. Blood sacrifices happened all the way through the Old Testament. If you've been a child raised in Sunday school, you know about the sacrifices. You know when Abraham, God called Abraham to take Isaac to the top of the mountain, and Isaac was going to be the sacrifice. And Abraham thought, oh God, that can't happen. He's my beloved child. But Abraham looked at Isaac and he said, Isaac, when Isaac said, Father... We have the wood and we've got the fire, but we don't have a sacrifice. And God said, Abraham said to Isaac through the power of the Holy Ghost, he said, God will provide a lamb. God will provide a sacrifice. And at the same time, Abraham and Isaac were going up one side of the mountain. There was an old goat, a ram if you will, that was going up the other side. You see, God has always got a plan and God's plan will work. The key is we've got to be engaged. We've got to do it just like He said to do it. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So what is there about the blood that could make it such a cleansing agent, Brother Dale? Blood is the one, the most difficult stains to get out of your clothes. Anybody ever bled on your clothes and tried to get the stains out? But every time I get out and get doing something, I come in, Teresa says, oh no, you're bloody again. And she starts squirting something on it to try to get the blood to dissolve. The Bible tells us that the most powerful cleansing agent in the world is the blood. In fact, God created blood to be a cleansing agent from the first time the first human being was born in your body. Blood takes oxygen and other supplies to cells and removes waste and impurities from the cells in your body. As a matter of fact, if you put a tourniquet on your hand or on your arm or on any extremity of your body, if you put a tourniquet and you stop the blood, that thing's going to die. It's the same way when you have a Christian and they become disconnected or they become throttled out of what God is doing and they become disconnected from the body, they will die. They will spiritually die. What are you saying, Brother Dale? The blood is a necessity. It's a necessity. Blood literally cleanses the filth from your body. It's one of its major responsibilities. There's no other cleansing agent known to man that can purify your body and its system as well as the blood that courses through our veins. There's no other cleansing agent known to man that can rid your souls of its filth and shame other than the blood of Jesus Christ. Blood was designed by God to use, to be used to wash away our sins. So why, Brother Dale? Why did God use blood? Why did He use blood? Well, I figured, or the Holy Spirit figured, that somebody would have that question in mind. Why didn't God just snap His fingers and your sins are forgiven? It's because sins are costly. They're costly. And when a sin is forgiven, it costs a price, a huge price. So why did God use blood first? The life is in the blood. Have you ever thought about that? When you lose your blood, your life is gone. When an animal loses its blood, its life is gone. The life is in the blood. So let's look at Leviticus 17 and 11. It simply says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. This is Old Testament, remember? We're going back now to the original Old Testament rules and regulations. They were taking a lamb, or they were taking an animal, whatever they could afford, they were taking it, and the priest would take that kill it, and offer the blood as a sacrifice for the sins that were there. So let's talk about the blood. In other words, God intended for the blood to make payment for our sins. A life's blood was shed for another to live. During the Passover, y'all remember the Passover when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and they call it Passover because that night, every house that had blood on the doorpost, it took three appearances of the blood over the top and down both posts, one, two, 
three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If they did what they were told to do, the name Passover came into effect because the death angel came through Egypt that night and if he saw the blood, he passed over. Can I tell you, God is the same. I'm so excited this morning because I know that when death comes, when death to humanity comes, when God has enough and He says, you had an opportunity and if the blood is not there, He won't pass over. The blood, is it applied to your life? Is it there? Can people see it? You say, Brother Dale, I don't want to be a part of that bloody religion. Then you'll have to face God for your sins because there's only one way to be cleansed from sin. During the Passover, an innocent lamb was slaughtered. Its blood smeared on the doorpost and the lentils of every Israelite home to remember when death was passed over. Blood constantly reminded the people that their sacrifice was to deal with the power of death. Blood was a reminder of life. And then second, we look at why did God use blood? Number two, the blood said that the price had been paid. The price had been paid. In order for blood sacrifice to be given to God, something had to die. Something had to die. God meant for His people to know how terrible that their sins were. Every time they sinned, they were required to offer up a blood sacrifice. In the Old Testament, every day at the temple, you'd see people lined up at the temple gate with their sacrifices being offered for the things that they had done. Can you imagine the trail of blood? Can you imagine the little lambs that were slaughtered? Can you imagine the animals that were killed over time because... Of the sins. Sin is an expensive thing. Day after day, sacrifices were offered to God. These sacrifices cost the blood, the life of an innocent animal to pay for the sins of the people. A price had to be paid, and that price was a life. The blood was the dearest price that could be paid. The blood. How many of you remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden? You all remember the story? Y'all were brought up in Sunday school. You remember when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden? Do you remember that Adam and Eve sinned against God? How did they do that? Some people say that she eat an apple, that he partook in the apple. It doesn't say anything about an apple, but it was a forbidden fruit. So I'm not sure what it was, but they rebelled against God by disobedience. And then, do you remember God come walking in the cool of the day, as was His custom? And it was customary for Adam and God and Eve to walk with God in the cool of the day but then that day came Adam and Eve had hid themselves and they realized that they were naked they were naked and they tried to take leaves and cover themselves and God come walking and he said Adam Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I'm over here hiding, God. I'm over here and we put fig leaves on. God said, that's not going to do. And I'm paraphrasing, but you read the story when you get time. God went and killed an animal. And the skins of that animal He put on them. A blood sacrifice, that was the first one. A blood sacrifice had to be offered because it was a penalty of death for sin. Disobedience against God is a penalty of death. How many of you have disobeyed God? Let me see your hand. Some of you are ashamed to raise your hand, but you might well get it up because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I'm here to tell you that God's love is so rich. It's so deep. It's so wide, it's so all-encompassing that His love cares for you so much He was not willing to leave you in the depths of your sin. He wasn't leaving, wasn't willing to leave you cankered and, and all scarred up and beaten up and looking like something nasty. But God said, I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to pay the penalty. I'm going to do what must be done for you to be welcome again into my throne room. How could He do it? It took the blood. It took the blood. Day after day, sacrifices were offered to God. These sacrifices cost the blood, the life of an innocent animal, to pay for the sins of the people. A price had to be paid. A life, the blood, was the dearest price. But then we find that there was a problem even. 
a problem with that. You say, Brother Dale, why didn't we bring little lambs to church this morning and let you kill them up here? Well, first of all, I would not have been able to probably do that. And second of all, it would never have worked. Hebrews 10 and 4 tells us it doesn't work, for it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Why? Because the blood of bulls and goats is a different creation. The blood of bulls and goats, you and I are human beings. Those are animals. And all God was saying was, I'm going to take the sins of the Old Testament, and when I see the blood, I know a price has been paid that will push back those sins. Push them back just a little bit where I don't have to see it. I'll look through the blood of the sacrifice of the bulls and the goats and the little animals. I'll look through that and I'll be able to see my people, but yet they can't come into my presence. They can't get near me because because I'm a holy God and people that are tainted and people that have damaged parts on them and people that are not perfect and not covered and not forgiven can't come into my... You remember when the children of Israel had come out of Egypt, they were camping in the wilderness and God began to tell Moses, He said, Moses, I'm coming down on the mountain and there's some specifics I want you to know, Moses. I want you to build a fence around the bottom of that mountain. Don't let beast nor man touch that mountain. And he said, if you touch it, or if any beast touches the mountain, it'll surely die. Why was that? It was because of the holiness of the presence of God. No man could come into the holiness of God. Why? Because their sins had just been pushed back a little bit. Their sins had just been covered a little bit by the blood of animals. God said, don't come. Moses, you're the only one that can come up. God's thunderings and lightnings were heard on the mountain. And then let's speed forward into the New Testament right quickly. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, He looked out through time and eternity into mankind and He said, It is finished. And when He said those words, the Bible says, your Bible says, the curtain tore from the top to the bottom that was separating the holiness of God from the normal people. The holiness of God, the presence of God, all of a sudden was... Did that wake you up? Opened up. The presence of God then invited, and He said in His Scripture, come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain help and mercy in the time of need. So did He not put a fence around His holiness anymore? No, He said, if you'll come in the blood, if you'll come in the sacrifice, if you'll come in the purity that's been paid for for you, you don't have to do anything but come in the blood. You ever hear anybody pray for anybody and say, I plead the blood? We don't plead the blood enough. The blood is the most powerful cleansing agent that's known to man. The blood cleanses. And I hope you remember this when you go out of this place. When your blood stops flowing in your body, the, the, the problem will be not that maybe your heart has stopped beating, but your body begins to die from the lack of the flow of the blood taking away the contaminants. Without the blood we die. But that blood had to pay a price. See, their blood couldn't give anybody anything, any forgiveness. It was just showing the terrible price that sin demanded, the blood of animals. But God used their blood as a shadow of things to come. And then we find in 1 John 1 and 7, and I'm speeding as much as I can here. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And what's the next part of this verse say? Read it with me. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son. There's something you missed. Notice C-L-E-A-N-S-E-S. -E Why didn't it say E-D? You missed that, didn't you? Why didn't it say, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed us from all sin? Many folk believe that one time to the cross, and you say, Lord, forgive me. 
And for one time, after you go to the cross, you never have to go back to God again. You can live like hell and still plan on going to heaven. My friend, that's the biggest lie that ever came out of the pits of hell. That word right there says, and His blood cleanses us. Your blood on the inside of your body cleanses your body because it's flowing. When the blood of Jesus Christ stops flowing in your spiritual life, you'll die. Spiritually, you'll decay. You'll die How can I be any clearer? His blood continually cleanses and takes away our sins. I'm almost done, I think. Our next point. Why was the blood of this man any different? What blood? There's been millions of people that gave their blood, their life's blood, for causes There have been people that have been martyred. There have been people that have died for just causes. Brother Robert, they've been people that stood up in front of a firing squad to try to relieve their family from losing their life. So why did this man's blood make any difference? What was the difference of this man? It's because this is real complicated. It's really, really deep. Are you ready for it? It's because it was His blood. It wasn't your blood. It wasn't nobody else's blood. But it was His blood. His blood did the trick. What are you saying, Pastor? It was His blood. Look at it. It was His blood. Hebrews 9 and 12. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with His own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. You see, His blood was holy blood. His blood was righteous blood. His blood was sufficient payment for the sins of all mankind. It's not me saying that it was sufficient. It was the Word of God saying it was sufficient. Jesus was born into this world. He was born of a woman, but His daddy was Father God. He never had an earthly father. He had a man. Joseph took care of him for a while here on this earth but he was never his blood father he was never his biological father if we can put it in technical terms he was the son of God very much God the son of an almighty God and the blood of God flowed through his veins and it was that blood because it was pure blood because it was undefiled blood he was born into this world yet he did no sin he was encompassed by sin he was tempted in all parts. He was pulled and tried and Satan showed up directly in front of him three times to tempt him. Your Bible says he did no... T- if he, go ahead and praise him. That's okay. If he had sinned, his blood would have not paid the price. If he had had an impurity in his blood, it would have not done the trick. And I hesitate using the word trick. It sounds kind of menial. It wouldn't have done what needed to be done. But he did no sin. And because God walked through heaven one day and He knew. Your Bible says that there was a lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. What does that say, Brother Dale? That means before Adam and Eve were ever born. God knew that He'd have to give His Son one day. But David, His creation, you and Danny and these beautiful girls, every one of you are so very special. Say, Brother Dale, what is the value of a human being? How can you put a price on something that God calls a jewel and a gem? How can you put a price on something that God values so highly that He sent His only Son to die I can't understand other than one thing, and this is the only thing that I know it could possibly be, is a spirit of suicide. I can't understand how anybody could take away their own life. It's a spirit of suicide that comes to destroy. But when I get thinking about the value of a soul, how can we snuff out, no matter how bad it's going for you, you, if you're born again, you, if the blood of Jesus is flowing in your veins, you, if you're a child of God, you are a 
valuable creation in the eyes of God. And if you're not saved, God died for you so that you could be. He died for you to show you how valuable that He is. He died for you to bring you in and to take that copper cleaner and to buff you and to clean you up. But even more than that, to go deep on the inside of you and forgive you from all the sins that you've committed that people know about that people don't know about. Some of you have hid, you've hid stuff for all your life. But isn't it amazing that even though God knows you, He knows everything about you, He knows everything that you've hidden, everything that you've never told anybody about, He knows every time you've been abused, He knows everything that you have abused, He knows every evil thought that you have thought. You say, oh, but Brother Dale, I never do wrong. I saw somebody, Brother Ken, one day, and I'm trying not to judge, but when you see things, it makes people able to do fruit inspection, right? So I wasn't judging this gentleman, but I knew his powerful stance, and I knew how he preached. And being on an airplane with him, I watched him. Y'all don't do that, do you? You don't watch people, do you? I watched his eyes. And this girl came in that was showing cracks that ought not never be shown. And I watched his eyes. Those of you who are embarrassed right now, you hadn't turned TV on lately, have you? Brother Dale, why say that in the church? Because it's in your home. But as I watched his eyes, I watched him even turn around in his seat and watch the rear end of the train as it went down the aisle. And I said, Father in heaven, the powerful message that's preached. And the Father reminded me, if you so much as look at a woman to lust after her. You've done something. You say, oh, it don't matter. It's just my eyeball. Yes, it does matter. The Word says you've committed adultery with her in your heart. Why would you say that, Brother Dale? Because you're guilty. It might not be looking at the train on the airplane. It might not be looking at the whatever. But there's something that knocks on your door. There's something that pulls on you. Why are you saying that, Brother Dale? Because I'm saying that Jesus Christ knew that that word cleanse shouldn't be in past tense. Because even after we get born again, even after we ask Him to forgive us, we're human beings. We still live in this stinking flesh. And the Bible says there's a war going on. Yes, we got to direct our eyes. Yes, we got to direct our thought process. But occasionally, if we do make a mistake, then according to God's Word, if there's no blood, we're excluded from the kingdom of heaven. Why do you say that, Brother Dale? Because the Word says, adulterers, liars, fornicators. You want me to go on with the list? It'll name you in there somewhere and me. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Why does it say that, Pastor? Because we need to remember the cost of sin. If I do something that's a sin, that's a sin against God, it costs God everything. There's another scripture that talks about how do do we just trample the blood underfoot of Jesus Christ? When we repetitively sin, when we repetitively do wrong, if we're a liar, if we don't come out from it, it means that eventually we're going to be treading under the blood our feet, the Lord Jesus Christ. So where am I going? I'm saying that this amazing love that you and I don't understand, this amazing God that we can't get our hands around, this amazing King that created the universe that sent His Son 
to die for you and me is interested in you. Son, He's interested in you. Whoever the oldest person is in here, He's interested in you. Say, Brother Dale, I'm used up. I'm spent up. I've done too much wrong to ever be good. No. The blood, one drop of the blood, will make you ready for the kingdom of heaven. But it doesn't stop there. How do you know that, Pastor? Because the Lord said to continue. We should go on with the works of God. Do the good things. Do the good parts. Let people see the fruit of what God has done. But let's get back to the message. Why Jesus? Why the blood? It's bloody good news. It's free. Don't cost you a dime. You can come to Jesus this morning, millionaire or pauper. You can come to Jesus this morning, old or young. But it does take something that's of high quality. It takes a tap on your heart. Because you see, nobody can be saved unless the Spirit draw them. You say, Brother Dale, the Scripture says today is a day of salvation. And yes, it is. And the Holy Spirit is everywhere. And when the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God and it goes out and touches the heart of men, then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit kicks in and He says, listen, don't you want to be free? Listen, don't you want to be clean? Listen, don't you want to be forgiven? I was at a Connect Group meeting the other night and I heard a precious lady and it has... It has made a mark in my spirit. And she said, I prayed about something and I just gave it up. And I felt so good after that. That's what the blood does. It cleanses. It's 12, 16. Are you worried? It's not three yet. I'm not even done. But I'm going to stop. Would you stand? Say, Brother Dale, why is it so important Because it's the only thing to get you into heaven. Do you have a ticket this morning? Are you blood washed material? Oh yes, preacher. I got saved 54 and a half years ago. And that's all I need. Well, I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for your testimony. But do you have a life that shows that you're washed and that the blood of Jesus is cleansing you constantly. You see, without the blood, we get cankered. Remember the old pot, the kettle? Without the cleansing, without the blood, we get cankered. We get mean. You know anybody that's mean that says they're a Christian? Father, in the name of Jesus, I know I didn't do justice to Your Word this morning. But Father, I did my best and I thank You for the anointing of Your Holy Spirit. Father, I'm asking You right now as You instructed me to do that as this altar call is given that two things would happen. Number one, that through this message no one can forget the price of the blood. And number two, that they will accept the sacrifice for the payment of their sins. Boy, girl, man or woman, God, we're all guilty. But thank You for that amazing love. God, thank You for going so deep into the barrel of sin and rescuing us and delivering us. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, Maybe this morning this has opened a door for some people that you now understand the simplicity yet the complexity of the blood of Jesus. Maybe for some people it's helped you to understand why the blood? Why is a life required? Why is a sacrifice required? And you understand how costly the sins that you've committed are. So my challenge to you is if God is knocking on your heart, right now is the time to come to the altar. Right now is the time to come and let people pray for you and let the blood of Christ wash over you and start flowing in your veins.
Or maybe you've gotten kind of cold and maybe your kettle is all beat up and dingy and stained this morning. The blood is the cleansing agent. And He's offering it today. They're going to sing a song. And I'm going to stand waiting as with our prayer warriors. Are you coming today? Say, Brother Dale, how old do I have to be? Old enough to realize that God's talking to your heart. Brother Dale, is there ever a time when I'm too old? Yes. Yes, there is. When you cross the line from time to eternity. If you haven't accepted the sacrifice by then, there'll be no more time and it'll be too late. You'll be too old. And for all eternity, you'll be absent from the Father. You'll be absent from the love of God. You'll be absent from the light of God. You'll be absent from the mercy of God. And my friend, that must be hell. Because God is love and He is mercy. And He cares so much about you. David said, though I make my bed in hell, lo, you're there. What was he meaning? He was meaning God's Spirit would still be reminding him of how much he paid for him. Joy, go ahead and sing. Would you come, please? God is calling. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, God is calling. People are coming. You don't have to be first. God is calling. Would you come? Say, Brother Dale, it's getting late. Yes, it is. It sure is. Jesus said that He was offering the sacrifice at the end of the age. People are coming. Would you come? I was lost and I was blind. I was running out of time. And sin separated. The breach was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. But behind heaven's throne, to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains and freed my soul, for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. my place made inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death has no sting and life has no end for I have been transformed by the blood 